This week, we look at the upcoming book, Suzanne, about 1920s tennis star Suzanne Longlin. How did she change the game? Why write a book about her? And how did the author trim Longlin's life down to just the right pieces to use in the book? Jason and I review the book, and then I talk with author Tom Humberstone about making the book. First, if you appreciate the work we do on Deconstructing Comics and our other podcasts and want bonus content, we'd love it if you'd support the show at patreon.com slash deconcomics for as little as $2 a month. Our monthly issue-by-issue look at 1960s Amazing Spider-Man comics is available to patrons chipping in at least $4 a month. Check out our goals and rewards and pledge your support now at patreon.com slash deconcomics. This is Tim. This is Jason. And this is Deconstructing Comics. Welcome to Deconstructing Comics. This is Tim in Tokyo with Jason in Portland. Uh, Not critiquing this time. This is a deconstructing. Uh, How are you doing? I'm delightful. Uh, I just read a fantastic graphic novel. (laughs) Oh, good. Yeah, well, let's talk about it. That always cheers me up. (laughs) Yeah, so this book is called Suzanne uh, by, I'm guessing his name is pronounced Tom Humberston, um, British. It looks like Humberstone to us, you know, benighted Americans, but uh, I think they pronounce it Humberston in the UK. I pronounce everything like a uh, like I'm a 13-year-old kid in junior high. <laughs> so he'd be Humberstone. Tom Humberstone. <laughs> That's a serious name. Yeah, he runs the gas station down the, down the street. Hey, Humberstone. <laughs> yeah, so this came out from, or is coming out from Avery Hill Publishing. I don't think it's out yet as we're recording this. I mean, you know, they they send us these things ahead of time to to review. Um, it's about uh, tennis player Suzanne Longlun, uh, who was big like in the 1920s. So yikes, a hundred years ago. Neither one of us had really been aware of her before, but uh, she was really a trendsetter in women's tennis uh you know she she played in a dress that didn't cover up her calves <gasps> you know because <laughs> you know it was still if you look up photos of women playing tennis in like 1900 you know they had the big flowery hats on and big long dresses going down to the ground and they're like how can you do athletics in in that get up but so she tried to break out of that and play it more like a man or like a ballerina, kind of. So, you know, really putting some work into it, and that long dress wasn't going to work. Also, it seemed like tennis was sort of a new phenomenon at the time, and she was an early female star of, mm-hmm. that, of that era. She was the first phenomenon. Uh, there, was, there was a precedent. She actually had... Um, people before her but mm-hmm. it seemed like she really captured the attention of of the press at the time well and it was still the era when in order to play in the tournaments you had to be an amateur okay that is a big part of the story mm-hmm. and i'm not sure i quite understood it by the end i got a, i got the idea that she had to make a choice and when she made that choice she could not go back um and this is a biography this is a 200 page book which i thought immediately like oh that's a huge, that's a long, long book. But once I got into it, this could have easily been a thousand page book or a 1200 page book. Mm -hmm. Uh, The author, Tom, he had to make some serious decisions about what that he was going to focus on. So he really focused on her and her journey through the sport and a few of her close relationships and what it was like to be a woman at that time. I don't think she had the ability to vote even. Um, She talks about yeah, that we, when they go to America, like women can vote here, just like in England, like just like in the UK. So apparently in France, women didn't have the vote yet. But they were able to drink. Uh-huh. Suzanne likes her cognac. This is my kind of sports story. <laughs> Someone who is like performing at like the highest level of their craft and just guzzling booze in front of an audience while they do it. <laughs> Tip of the During hat. prohibition in America. Prohibition. <laughs> um, so one of the things that Tom, you know, so Tom has to narrow the focus, really. There's so many tangents you can go on in history. Um, but yes, this idea of like 
you're an amateur and you can play Wimbledon and win all these awards, but it's not okay for you to make money at your craft, at what you're good at. And that if you do that, if you become a professional, you can't go back to the other world. They're t- they'll turn their back on you because mm-hmm. you've decided to make money at this thing that you love. And it's bankrupting her family to keep her in this lifestyle, mm-hmm. to keep her a champion. It's a really inter- interesting um, conflict that they've set up. And it's one that I also feel carries over to today well it reminded me of the you know, the whole debate nowadays about college athletics that mm-hmm. you know you got to you know the student athletes can't make money but they're earning tons of money for their schools and their coaches uh, yeah, and well. sponsors but yeah the students themselves you know it would it would ruin the purity to have them make any money from what from the sport that they're the ones who are playing it and yeah the, they had that attitude about tennis actually i looked into it 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 didn't change until like 1968 uh when the open era began and we talk about a tennis open it means amateurs and professionals can play in the tournament it's open to anybody but okay that didn't I was not- happen until until like 40 years after she was gone thank you for looking that up because i was really curious because i know like she was unable to play wimbledon as a professional uh, which mm-hmm. did not jive with what I understand Wimbledon to be. And they bring up this idea of shamateurism, which is like, it's a sham that you're an amateur. Uh, right, because so they're like money under the table and and people like are padding their expenses because I guess their expenses were paid by the tennis uh, ruling body. So you just make your money by padding your expenses. But you can't uh, draw an income from that. Right, you're, what you win is the plate. <laughs> Here, have a silver plate. <laughs> you know, I didn't have before I started this book. I thought it was going to be a chore. I don't have a lot of affinity for tennis at all. It's probably down there with golf and things that, like, you know, that I'll have to watch when I'm in hell. Uh, but this book totally pulled me in. It's a really unique world. It's a unique time setting, and the character of Suzanne is one that you. She's a punk. She's really contrary to the world around her. She mm-hmm. wants a better life for herself, and she's demanding things, and you immediately root for her. And I still feel like there's a lot I, I don't know about her, which is great. Mm-hmm. Um, this book doesn't get bogged down in um, alcoholism. It's it's like a background thing that she drinks a lot, but it's never, you know, she's not like falling down drunk in a match or something. They don't do the Hollywood thing. <laughs> and if she has any sort of romantic leanings or anything, it's left out of this book. This book is really tightly focused on her career. I was wondering about that because I was kind of expecting we were going to find out she had an affair with a woman. But, yeah, we don't see her with anybody. Um, I found out she did get into a long-term relationship starting in 1927, which, you know, that's kind of after the focus of this book. So, um, yeah, she was she was going with this guy named, get this, Baldwin Baldwin. Oh, Baldwin Baldwin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who uh, he was from a rich family and he was actually married to somebody else who wouldn't give him a divorce or something and so she didn't actually marry him but uh, they had kind of a long-term relationship although she died really young she she did die young she died at like 38 mhm doesn't it crush you to be like i i think of i'm in my 40s and i look at people's great accomplishments and then i look where i am like, I'm in the Tin Machine era of David Bowie. <laughs> <laughs> she had accomplished so much and died at 38. And they don't tell you what she died of. No. Had, because it would be a distraction. It's not the story that Tom is telling. And I just, I've read a lot of scripts from my students and from my peers. And I know when a book has been polished and focused and really sharpened to its most effective storytelling. And this is it. This is a really, really strong way to tell a story. Yeah, other- well, looking into her, I found, yeah, there's a lot of other stuff that's not in the book. But, yeah, he really picked and chose what he was going to include. And he also gives a lot of flavor of the time the story takes place in. One of my favorite parts, she's not in every scene. Every now and then he'll step out from her story and just give you an idea of what's going on in the world for context. And there's this one little moment where these kids are up in a tree because they want a good view of the match. And these cops are like, get out of there, get out of there. And then the cops climb up and take their place and watch. (laughs) And I just thought, you know, a lesser storyteller wouldn't have done that. 
just mm. would have focused on the person, the person, the person, and you know, filled every every you could easily fill two thousand pages uh, of Susan's accomplishments, Susan's accomplishments. But he really made it feel like a time and a place, and brought me into mm. a world that I'll never visit. Well, and there's this whole sequence about where they're making wine, like in Europe, I guess, and then they're shipping it out and dropping it off at different places. And in America, it's like they have to do it really sneaky and because it's prohibition. Yeah, I thought that was really, really pages. smart. Yeah, but it, it's, it's it gives you a good break from Suzanne. You don't want to get tired of Suzanne. I want to remind you, she also drinks a lot, so she's going to America. And you know that even though she's getting cocktails you know it's under the table or it's at uh, speakeasies and it's just it, I, I love stuff like that you really it's good world building mm-hmm. without beating you over the head saying prohibition is now a thing i don't even know that they even come out and say prohibition is a thing um I, yeah i don't remember the word prohibition being in there but it was yeah. pretty clear what they were talking you know the, it's mentioned that alcohol is illegal so you know you know what era that is yeah. Um, yeah. She was 39 when she died in uh, July 1938, and yeah, in the back of the book, the kind of runs down her record here: 241 titles, 181 match winning streak, 341 and seven match record, world number one for eight years. Not bad so, for an amateur. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, also, what I love that Tom included in the back is because we know this is, uh, you know, um, a stylized version. It's a biography, right? So you're picking and choosing and you're creating a narrative from someone's life. And history rarely gives you a perfect three act structure. And he fully admits, like, I tweaked a couple of things to fit the story better. And he lists the things that he did that were sort of departures from the truth. Hmm. The things that he like, he may have moved one event two years earlier because it just fit the timeline better. I love stuff like that as a storyteller because it's problem solving a, a real life story. You know, when you see a biop of like you know Freddie Mercury or Elton John. Oh yeah, well they yeah the the Mercury one definitely you know, huge changes to the yeah. historical record. And you know we we know that you're doing that, and I just love that Tom was like, these are the things that I had to do to make the story work. Uh, like creating a sort of a rain in the rain moment with Suzanne and this rival that she had had or this opponent she had. And it really humanizes them. They run into each other in the rain and have this great moment. And then you find out later, no, they just ran into each other at a cafe, but that's not enough. You need to have a moment between the two of them. Mm. And I, I love stuff like that. I think it's great storytelling and it's great problem solving. I'm looking at that page in the back. Yeah. For example, page 124, this win against Mola Mallory at Wimbledon was in 1922, the year after her default in New York. Moved her banner year of 1925 for efficiency. (laughs) Okay, but I have read comic book biographies that read like a Wikipedia page, and they're mind-numbingly boring. I'm not mm. going to call them out because my friends have worked on them. <laughs> but if you if you just regurgitate history, it's not entertaining. It, mm-hmm. it doesn't take you on a ride. This took me on a ride from beginning to end, and that they omit things or just don't turn the camera in certain directions is, is to its strength. I think Tom did it. Tom Humberson did an amazing, amazing job. We have to call out, this is a 200-page book that is written, really well-written, edited and revised, illustrated, colored, and I assume lettered by one person. Mm -hmm. That is a tremendous, tremendous undertaking. And there wasn't any, there wasn't a single panel that I felt like was out of place in this book. And some of the pages had upwards of 10 panels, which should be too crowded. It was not. Hmm. Yeah, I didn't even really note. I mean, I just like during those tennis playing sequences, sometimes there are a lot of small panels and uh, like showing the changes in score and stuff. Um, but yeah, it just it just works. There were there was a, a few times where she would change locations and they would have um, this sort of wandering eye. It would give you like a scene of the water, a scene of the trees, the grapes, the people, what they're doing. It would go all around this environment to give you sort of context and settle you in a new place. Um, really smart choices with where the splash pages would be. Just really like firing on all all, all cylinders. I'm just really really impressed. Uh, if there's one ding I have against this, and it's just uh, part and parcel of doing a biography, is that you're sort of you inherit the characteristics of the people that you're portraying. And I think every single character in this book has dark hair. 
<laughs> right? Every man is wearing a suit. Uh, like because it's in the 1920s, you don't have a guy with like a long beard or a sideburns. There's she has two friends, um, Coco and Teddy, and you can tell them apart because Coco has like wavy hair and Teddy has straight hair. <laughs> And the same thing with the women. Like uh, she, um, Suzanne has like this really distinct, uh, beautiful nose. And so with the other female characters that she runs into, they're almost all dark-haired, long, dark-haired women, just like her. Uh, but there's like these little differences. Uh, Suzanne's hair is like a little bit curlier than most people's hair. So little stuff like that, I had mm-hmm. to remind myself of people's characteristics and their names. So it was helpful. But Tom does a good job of bringing people's names up repeatedly. Yeah, yeah, Suzanne, I looked at the photos online. She did have a rather large nose, but I feel like he doesn't quite do her justice in terms of her looks cuz I think you know, in real life she was a little more attractive than than how she's drawn here. Well, you want to be careful not to, you know, accentuate the wrong properties. This isn't a story about romance or sexuality or her, her beauty is, is not part of the story at all. No, it's, it's really about the sacrifices that she made, the training that she went through and the mm-hmm. world that she had to inhabit. And just this double standard of like, you're winning all these awards, but don't you make a nickel at it. Mm-hmm. And then when you do, they're going to turn their back on you. And I just feel that's, you know, you talked about professional sports. I feel like a lot of that pulls over to cartooning too. I bet you Tom is, actually had issues like that. I've had issues like that where people expect you because it's comics or because you're a writer or you're an artist that you should work for free, that you should, you know, just for the joy of your craft. (laughs) To which I say, you know, if you clogged your toilet and you called a plumber, would you expect them to come to your house and unclog the toilet for the joy of their craft? (laughs) (laughs) You know? Yeah, well, and there are always people, whatever your job is, uh, the p- people, like friends who like want you to do it, give them a freebie, you know. I, I knew somebody who was a photographer, and people were always asking him to oh. shoot their photos for free. Right. Now, I, I, I've had many people say, oh, you should write my life story. <laughs> I'm like, I get, I get, no, I get paid to do this. I have plenty of stories on my own. And like, no, no, my life story is pretty amazing. I'm like, not if you're talking to me. <laughs> like, if you fall in this low, <laughs> trust me. <laughs> All right. So you know what I thought about, like, not to compare it to anything else, but like, I am absolutely fatigued of superhero comics. And mm. I thought this, this book just inspired me. It got me really excited because it's an excellent example of what the medium is capable of. And I think I would highly recommend this book to people outside of comics as much as people inside of comics. I think you could if you enjoyed The Queen's Gambit, this is should also be on your reading list. It's the highest it recommends for me. And also just a testament to Tom, a 200-page book written, illustrated, colored, and lettered by one person. That is a tremendous, tremendous achievement. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and the art is really sharp, and the coloring just oh, makes yeah. it all the sharper. Let's talk about the coloring because that's a it's amazing what mm-hmm. what he chose to do, uh, sort of giving each time period a different color palette, so it feels like we're progressing through time. Um, the hook, the prologue. There's a prologue that sets up her at her deathbed, which isn't spoiling anything. I can't spoil a book based on. Um, historical facts but <laughs> it has like this sort of nice blue palette and then we jump to like these great colors these great sort of like peaches and yellows and reds and i was just really really impressed with the color the colorist and i went to look who colored it at the end and i'm like did tom really do all of this that is legitimately amazing uh, just just a great great achievement and i honestly i, I want to know how long it took him hmm yeah i don't know but yeah i'm mean, looking at some of the other pages i mean a lot of i'm like i'm looking at page 22 and there just is a bit of a kind of texture to it you see the guy at the top of the page wearing who is he supposed to be um i think maybe he's supposed to be a policeman he's wearing a uniform and it's got wrinkles in it and there's it's in kind of shadow and you know you can really just feel a texture to it and he's got a nice thick line around him um and that he just pops out of the panel each of the chapters starts with like just a single object on a white background and then it goes like this sort of red t- it takes a highlight from the chapter and gives it like this red tint mm-hmm. and just from a design pers- idea it-, it got me like amped like every <laughs> chapter has like this little reset um which you don't have to do in a graphic novel you could just bar- barrel right through um but i love that there's like this little break 
take a deep breath, and then the roller coaster starts again. So just from a design perspective, this is really, really strong. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to read it again, and I'm going to recommend it to people. I'm just really, really, really happy um, that to, to have discovered this. Yeah, and I thought the, uh, you know, it can be difficult to do sports in comics, and I think he did a really good job in the tennis scenes. Uh, like you kind of feel like you're you're watching this tennis match, and the lettering too. Like when she, there's a sequence where she's like huffing, she's exhausted, and she's leaning over, mm-hmm. and the huffs and the balloons just get bigger and bigger and bigger. And you know, in electronic lettering, it's easy to make that look to lose the impact to repeat it that way. Um, but there's so much organic life to this hand drawn lettering. It could be a mix of both, but those those. Uh, sound effects are definitely hand drawn, and they look great. Yeah, and uh, yeah, the scorekeeping—you know—I don't know how tennis works, <laughs> but I see the numbers, the way the numbers and the editing. Like it is, this is a cinematic approach. Mm-hmm. Well, there is a little bit of a tennis explainer at the very beginning of the book, <laughs> which I did flip back to <laughs> <laughs> during it. That was super helpful. Uh, so the, the, my biggest questions at the end were, and I just think because I'm dense, like, um, which, which is the distinction between being an amateur and being a professional in this world, and you explained it, like when and where that sort of worlds, those the, that barrier eroded. But he does a really good job, you know, focusing on other characters, like her opponents uh, and what their lives are like outside of playing her. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just re- everyone's, I, everyone feels like a human, fully rendered character. They're not just there to be a prop in her story, which I think is great. It's really, really smart choices. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, I have no notes for Tom. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> not, not at all. Just I've, Congratulations. This is a fantastic book. Mm-hmm. And if you love the medium at all, don't be afraid. If you're not familiar with comics or you're not familiar with tennis or you're not familiar with Suzanne's life, uh, you'll probably even enjoy it even more. Because it's going to be such a, a delightful surprise and journey. Yeah, I mean, it. It. Uh, I mean, I was just talking on critiquing comics uh, with Emmett about a, a book on a historical topic that I felt like the book didn't give me a reason to really care about the to- the subject, and this book did a better job of like kind of getting me into the context of the world and and uh, explaining. Uh, why this was interesting, you know, getting me interested in it. Yeah, there's a um, Joshua Marston is a, is, is a filmmaker, a writer filmmaker who I really, really appreciate. And he has a, uh, his quote is that the best stories feature a character with a very specific need in a really unique world. And I think that is totally uh, applies to Suzanne. Hmm. No one is tired of tennis stories in the 1920s <laughs> no <laughs> right this is a unique world and it's it's a you know it's a it's our world 100 years ago and some things are still there some of the sexism is still there mm. um, and some of the parallels are there like what you talked about with sports uh college sports it's mm-hmm. yeah just fantastic yeah, yeah. And, the, and also the sportswear comes up a lot too i we did uh, over skip that but there was a designer in here who was talking about uh the the future of sportswear. Yeah, what do you say? This year, this generation sportswear is next generation's formal wear. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, he he she was wearing a lot of his fashions, and he was trying to use her as a as an advertisement for his work. Yeah, yeah, and, and you see that today. I mean, that is just that, that NASA idea that has exploded. Uh, just yeah, love it. I'm just flipping through it. The colors are great. The character work is great, and yeah, the highest of recommends. I'm so 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 happy I read this. Coming up, my talk with Suzanne author Tom Humberstone. How long did it take him to make the book, and how did he keep putting food on the table during a long creative process? What's his interest in Suzanne Longlin, and what's next for him? All that and more coming up. But first, a reminder to join us for 20th Century TV and Music Trivia Quiz videos and more on our Patreon page. Every month, patrons donating $4 a month or more also get a full-length podcast episode reviewing an issue of The Amazing Spider-Man by Lee and Ditko. Check out our goals and rewards at patreon.com slash decomcomics. 
If you'd rather give a one-time donation, you can do so via PayPal by sending it to mail at deconstructingcomics.com. We appreciate your support. Edward and Alphonse Elric, as a result of attempting the forbidden act of resurrecting their mother with alchemy, have paid the price. Edward lost an arm and a leg. Alphonse lost his whole body, his soul now attached to a suit of armor. Together they search for a way to make their bodies complete again and uncover a deadly plot by their country's military rulers. That's the concept of Hiromu Arakawa's Fullmetal Alchemist, one of the best manga ever made. Tim and Patrick are rereading Arakawa's masterwork in search of interesting sound effects, translation errors, goofy humor, and, oh yeah, a great story. The podcast is The Law of Equivalent Exchange, a chapter-by-chapter look at the manga Fullmetal Alchemist. New episodes every other Monday, wherever podcasts are found. What are you willing to exchange? Okay, I'm now talking with Tom Humberstone uh, in the UK. How are you doing? Yeah, not too bad, thanks. How are you? Okay. Where are you located exactly? I live in Edinburgh in Scotland. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. We thought we would uh, get Tom on the line here and ask some questions. Some of them were provided by Jason just to give him credit. Or I asked him for questions and some of his were the same as mine and some were maybe a little bit different or completely different. So, (laughs) Sure. um, Okay. okay. So uh, how long have you been making comics? Yeah, so... um... On and off, I'd say about 20 years. I I was making comics when I was at uh, art college, but it was a side sort of thing I was doing. Uh, I was studying animation at the time, and I was making little one-off comics hmm. that were like um, caricatures or character assassinations of art school archetypes that I would post around art college. Um that was sort of the start. Um, and I'd always do them on and off while I was like working in graphic design or in the film industry very briefly after I graduated. Um, but it was, I'd say I've only been doing it sort of professionally and managing to make a living from it and illustration for the past 10 years. Hmm. Okay. Uh, which cool. is when I went full time freelance. Mm-hmm. Okay, and I was looking at your website. It looked like there's kind of a variety of stuff there. Some political cartoons, some like illustrated poems. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, and in appearing in a lot of different publications. So, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I, I started off. Um, I, I think a lot of my work has been nonfiction. So there's been a lot of political comics I've done for the Neb and Buzzfeed and various other publications and um but alongside that so i've got this non-fiction work and then i really enjoy the abstract sort of art side of comics and i've been making a lot of poetry comics with chrissy williams who's a poet we sort of met and um bonded over the similarities between the two mediums and the ways in which they can work together. And so we've been doing a lot of experiments in that and just slowly finding a way to sort of work together as writer and artist, but in not in a strictly sort of script and, you know, artist drawing the script kind of way. Mm-hmm. Um, we co-edited a book called Over the Line about poetry comics. Mm-hmm. I see. So now is Suzanne your first like full book comic? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I take it you did all of the art and coloring and lettering everything yourself. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. How long did the whole process take? I'd say from after I completed, I mean, as much as one can complete the research on on a book like this, uh, I'd say from right, starting writing the script to handing in the finished pages, it probably took about two years. Mm, okay. Um, but it, I was sort of working on the, like researching it and figuring out the outline and structure of it for probably another two years mm-hmm. on top of that. But that was uh, very much on and off while I was taking on lots of other work as well. Ah, well, yeah, you got interruptions, so <laughs> you got, <laughs> got to keep the money coming in from other sources. 
Yeah, as a sort of job in freelance illustrator, uh, the only way I was able to draw this, I'd say relatively quickly in, in two years, is um, I, I applied for Creative Scotland funding. Uh, so I got mm-hmm. Arts Council funding to uh, to essentially be able to turn down illustration work and, and focus on this exclusively. Um, mm-hmm, I, see. I, still took, I had to still take on other work as well, but um, mm-hmm. yeah, like, there's no way I could have done this while also <laughs> mm. uh, without that, that funding. I see. And what was your process like? Were you like kind of writing and drawing at the same time, or did you like completely finish the script and then start drawing? So early doors, I um, I was able to use some of that uh, funding to hire Larry Harris, who is the editor at the Neb, who's edited the majority of my work there. And she's an amazing editor, and I we work well together. So I I asked if she'd be interested in editing this with me, and um, and sort of helping shepherd the the book from from the get go. So and she very kindly agreed, and we so because of that, and because I also wanted to show this um, like an early version of this to publishers and, um, you know, get other feedback along the way. I made sure I, I had a full finished script before I started drawing anything. And mm-hmm. I wrote it fairly, fairly screenplay, like, you know, pretty, I wanted it to be a, I wanted to be able to show it to people as a written document and people could understand and give me feedback about whether pages were working, you know, whether it's, you know, hopefully the, 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 the script was able to like create the, 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 the comic in people's minds as they read it. But um, that's not always how I, I like to work, but I thought it was best to for a book this length and mm-hmm. for the amount of work it involved. I think I really needed to have a very strong structure from the get go. Okay. And so time-wise then, how did the two years break down? Like how much of it was on the script and how much of it was on the art? <clears throat> yeah, I'd say there's about, it's a tricky one because I'd say when I started writing the script, that probably took about two months, some maybe three months um, with some back and forth and, and going through a couple of drafts. But we're talking like another two years of research and figuring out the structure of that beforehand. Oh, wow. So okay. like, as I was like researching it, I was writing all of these notes and collecting cards, putting them on walls, moving them around, figuring out how, where scenes were going to go, whether that scene was needed, trying to figure out if I needed to remove characters or add characters and how much that, because as much as it is a almost like a biopic in some structure, mm-hmm. it 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 needs and, and and it's a real person and it's real history. I'm talking about. I don't. I never wanted to sort of, you know, make anything up, or, you know, or, <laughs> or, or, or go against, um, you know, be dishonest in any way about you know the reality of what happened to all of these people but I also needed to make sure that I knew what I wanted to say about this story what themes and ideas were important to me from the you know the first time I got interested in the story and then what whether there were actually going to be arcs because you know these are real people and um, they're going to um you know, you're going to have arcs and, and, and character arcs already made for you to a certain extent, but mm. I needed to figure out what I wanted to say about that. Like, there are various things that we can get into on that because uh, there's a, only a certain amount of research you can do on Suzanne to an extent in terms of how she tells her own story because she died when she was 39 and didn't get to write a, a book about her career and mm-hmm. how she really felt about it in later life, like a lot of tennis players get to. So, um, you know, it's about trying to figure out, for me, it was about 
frame in Suzanne, the real person, and not the legend, the icon, and all of these other things that she was and what she represented, and making sure that the real person came through. Um, mm -hmm. So it was about trying to sort of, yeah, this very long rambling answer to that question. <laughs> right. Okay. Did you discover anything about the story once you started drawing it that wasn't in the script as written? Um, no, I think I think most of most of what's in the script is on the page. Um, I always tweaked word word in to the very last day. You know, that's one mm -hmm. of the like. I feel like when you talk about uh, drafts of like a screenplay or something, there's like. Um, you know, various different iterations before you start filming. When it comes to comics, you've got like the thumbnails is another draft, and then the penciling is another draft, and, mm. the inks and, and so. Um, and the last one is the, the lettering at the end when you're, you know, just tweaking a few words here and there, or you're maybe adding a few, taking a few out. So there's always that. You're always finding a different rhythm uh, to make sure that. It all reads and flows properly. Um, I don't know if there are like new new things I added or decided not to to use in the end. I have a think. Um, <laughs> okay. I might remember something by the end. All right. Um, so, what got you interested in putting together a book about Suzanne Longlin? Yeah. Well, um, I've always been a big fan of tennis, and I. I found I was getting a lot more into it around the sort of 2015, 2016. Uh, I was just watching a lot more, following the, the tour a lot more closely than I, I, I used to. And um, a lot of reasons for that. Partly uh, the the world was getting more depressing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I escaped into uh, sports a little bit. Um, but uh, I, I knew the name of Suzanne Long Long. Uh, because uh, there's a court at uh, Roland Garros, the French Open, named after her. and But that's all I knew. I knew that there was a court named after her, that there was like a statue uh, of her, and that she was a famous French player from the 20s. I'm not even sure if I knew that at the time. Mm. Um, but I was reading a book called Love Game uh, by Elizabeth Wilson, which is like a history of the sport from its origins through to the modern era and uh there's a chapter on suzanne in that which uh just really surprised me i just had no idea about this person and, and the things that she achieved and the ways in which she changed not just the sport but like women's fashion in the 20th century it was a fascinating uh story and the more th that sort of sent me down a, a, a you know wiki rabbit hole for a while and just the more I read about her, the more I was surprised that we didn't, she wasn't like a household name in the way that, I guess if, if you ask most people to name like a, a sports player from the 20s, they might come up with Babe Ruth and that's about it. But like, you know, at the time, like she was bigger than that. She was a global phenomenon. I'm never going to be able to say phenomenon. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and this like huge global superstar um, and arguably like the first sports superstar because we're, and that's what I found really interesting is she also came out, this also happened while we're going through this post World War One era, everyone, it, there's a lot of hedonism and indulgence, but all of that's wrapped up in trauma and everyone needed something, a, a new sort of form of entertainment. That's when like people became much more interested in sports as mm. a, an entertainment medium you know it was uh it was generally seen as this like pastime for the for the rich really mm -hmm. um, mm. and and this is when it sort of became like an industry so there's that like the invention of c celebrities uh, sort of really came around that time but also the way fashion was changing the way uh, gender roles were changing uh, so she's sort of like at the center of this sort of all of these different changes and she almost like represents it in a way because like her eyes mirrors the jazz age and and, uh, and fall uh, like the whole thing sort of like 
seemed like a perfect story and yet uh, there's like one one main book that like uh looks at Suzanne there's another one by a guy called Alan Little uh that half of it is like match stats and and you know so it's it, and it's quite dry and I, mm-hmm. I just realized like there's a story here that I want to read that uh, doesn't and so that was uh, the beginnings of it mm, I see okay now obviously there's a lot more information about her that you could have put in the book how did you go about picking and choosing what to put in and what not to yeah uh i think all of those things i was mentioning there like um i started breaking it down in terms of every chapter would revolve around a particularly important match in her life and how that match would probably map on to a, a theme of that chapter. And that's sort of how I started building it. And so I knew that I'd be jumping through time quite a bit in terms of like every chapter would join her a few years later. Mm-hmm. And the conversations before and after this new match would sort of form the basis of catching the reader up to what's been happening, mm-hmm. place the context of what, what we're actually talking about in this chapter and what what sort of themes and ideas I want to get at. And so it was about that. It was about slowly figuring out an efficient way to tell, like, you know, someone's life story across 200 pages and, and mm-hmm. you're always going to miss things out. And it's just about, I, I guess there's this point during the research where you have you have to start figuring out Okay, I I know all the things that definitely happened, all the things that might have happened that I can only corroborate in from one or two sources. There's a version of this that would be like, you know, a 500 page prose book about all the things that I can and can't corroborate, and then all the things that happened to her chronologically. But that's not what, what is interesting. What is interesting is what initially drew me to the project and you've got to try and reframe that and refocus that in your, your head as you're coming up, coming up with the structure. So, uh, yeah, I just sort of started to, um, I think it was, it was deciding that there were about four or five important matches that could be, uh, used to sort of, um, frame, frame her life and say a different thing about her life that I wanted to get at. Mm-hmm. I see. Mm. And then in the back matter of the book, you mentioned there were some points where you took liberties with like moving events around a little bit. And of course that kind of thing goes back at least to Shakespeare, you know, and you see that kind of kind of futzing with the history to make a better narrative all the time. Um, but I don't know, part of me kind of, cringes at that especially if it's something major like the timing of freddie mercury's aids diagnosis in bohemian sure. rhapsody um yeah. so do you think there's a point at which taking liberties with the narrative goes too far or how do, how do you decide if it's going too far or not yeah i don't know if i've ever developed like a taxonomy in my head about that um but i agree with you i think that there are certain things where what you're doing is you're fundamentally changing who that person was. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the, the, yeah. Oh, I don't want this to turn into some sort of rant about Bohemian Rhapsody. Um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I think, I think I have a problem with a lot of biopics for that sort of reason. And mm-hmm. also I think that there's a particular kind of story structure that I, you know, there's a certain thing you can't avoid when you're telling the story of a real person. But I would try to circumvent or subvert the tropes as and as and when they came, and try to do something interesting with it. Or at least I was hoping to do that. I don't know. I'll have to listen to your review to find out if you agree <laughs> whether I did it or not. But I, um, yeah, I think that there are limits to how much you can and can't change. I. 
uh, I put that stuff at the back because I'm one of those people who, when I get to the end of a book or a TV show um, or film about a person, you just immediately want to start Googling and finding out what was true about that thing. Mm -hmm. So I I almost wanted to save people the trouble and say, here are the things that I did change. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, like... um, People will see the reasons why I changed those things. And that I think they're pretty small. They're not changing any of the, um, the things that she did or when she did them. Uh, there's a few creative licenses I took with, um, I guess, the adventures uh, she and her uh, family have and, and her sort of um, entourage have mm-hmm. in America. In terms of the timing of when they, what, when, you know, whether the clubs they went to, like the Prohibition era clubs were even open at that time, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So um, those were just little things where I like, uh, the, the more I was researching that era, I kind of, I wanted Suzanne to meet Texas Guinan and and, or Guinan I'm not entirely sure I've only read that name I've never said it out loud (laughs) Um, but uh, there are certain things like that Um, or like I've melded I've moved the way in which Suzanne met Bill Tilden you know a little bit earlier than they would have actually met and things Mm. like that I don't think any of that fundamentally changes the story uh, and like the realities of the story but I do agree that there are limits. Um, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the conversations in the story are private conversations that, you know, there's no recording of. Um, I know some of them were, well, like when she meets, uh, I think it's Helen Wills in the rain. You say, I think your mm-hmm. notes said that that was just sort of something that you, created to give them a chance to communicate more did i understand that correctly yeah i think i think the only time that they actually did meet was at a, a like in a coffee shop in you know like when some press were around so i don't know if they would have had a particularly mm-hmm. uh, conversation at the time mm. so well, what do you how do you decide what to have them say in those situations where you can't really know what they said <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think at that stage, a lot of it is projection and deciding on who I think these people are based on the research I've done. And all of that will always be about probably saying more about me and the way in which I see these people than the reality is. Um, what I'm hoping is I'm getting at a kind of an impressionistic version of the truth as much as I understand it. And Mm. um, the idea of this book, rather than telling it in prose form or like, or as a kind of nonfiction comic, the fact, the reason I've made it historical fiction and allowed myself to invent these conversations and, and, and have dialogue that I don't know necessarily actually happened is her life was like full of vibrancy and sass and you know she was full of life and um there was there was a version of this book that could could end up being quite dry and i didn't want i that didn't feel like that was suzanne longland's life at all like it, it was never dry and it was never boring and unfortunately, you know, a lot of people who are in it, like, they're all dead. You know, I, I don't have an opportunity to ask any of these people about that, that time at all. Mm-hmm. Um, so the best for me, it was about trying to convey how it would have felt and how, um, how that time was and how Suzanne came across and how she dealt with fame and, and, and tell a story about her character and how her character changes across, across this and how it sort of develops calluses, you know, uh, like she develops like a hard shell in order to deal with it. And, Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I think 
I'm hoping that like uh, making that decision makes it feel more real and more more alive to people when they read it than than it would would have been if it was like a documentary. Mm-hmm. Okay. I noticed there are several points in the book where we're entering a scene and we start like someone in the middle of someone's sentence, maybe even in the middle of a word. Uh, um, what were you trying to convey by doing that? Um, I don't know. I quite like, uh, uh, that, that's actually a thing that I find happens a lot in comics, but maybe I'm wrong about that. Hmm. Probably some do, I suppose. I just kind of <laughs> popped out at me in this one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I really like, um, coming in, in the middle of a scene, um, I think there's a there's a couple of uh, quotes about this. I think uh, is it William Goldman who might have said, yeah, "I'd rather be." It's probably not William Goldman, but <laughs> the, quote, the quote is, "I'd rather be confused for five minutes than bored for 15. Mm. So I think there's something about throwing the reader in at the end and having to like you know just join in, catch up, figure out what's going on. Mm-hmm. Uh, I also just like getting into a scene late and leaving early. I don't feel I need, you know, the beginnings of a scene when people are introducing themselves to each other. You know, like I, right, I like, yeah. but, but I know that that's not what you're asking. You're asking, you know, there's a particular kind of um, aesthetic choice in actually joining mid sentence. Yeah, or um, mid word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, I just, I quite like it. Um, I think that's just, a, yeah, maybe that's just, a, yeah, personal preference. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hmm. Okay. There's one scene that I wanted to ask you to explain to me because I didn't quite catch what was happening. Sure. I think it's just after she beats Helen Wills. Uh, she goes back to her room and there's money and a ledger on the table and she sweeps it all off the table and starts sobbing. And I didn't understand what what was bothering her there. Okay. Oh, that's a, that's a, you know that's, that's the fault of a comic, not not you not you there. <laughs> um, so the, um, the that chapter is a large part of that chapter is about who makes money from tennis and mm. where who stands to gain from it. So the mm-hmm. chapter opens with Helen Wills talking to a tennis journalist about shamateurism, which uh, at the time of, uh, before the open era of tennis, before uh, you ha- had people being paid to play, you know, like you do now, mm-hmm. uh, it was essentially like you pay for the, uh, the joy of it. And so it was largely only rich people who could play. Mm-hmm. And so... But there was also the idea that, you know, hotels would be paid for the players and they'd be getting gifts and they'd be reimbursed for various, like, expenses. And so there was this idea of shamateurism instead of, mm-hmm. the, you know, the more noble amateur game. Um, and so that's where the chapter sort of opens, where it, it, it sort of explains what that that concept is. Mm-hmm. And... Um, as we go through that chapter, uh, Suzanne is being introduced to the idea of possibly turning professional mm-hmm. and abandoning the amateur game, which would sort of cut her off from the main institutions of tennis, but mm-hmm. she'd be able to make money. We find out that her family are poor because uh, they've been um, trying to keep up with the Joneses, as it were, and try and convey this idea of wealth and luxury when actually they weren't making any money and they, they were, you know, running out of it. Um, that a lot of her decision-making was taken away from her by the French Federation, who wanted her to play with French players. And so, so I know you know this, but I don't know this, why not? Um, and so uh, the idea is that that, match in 1925 in Cannes was the uh, was what's known as the match of the century. It mm-hmm. was the biggest tennis match that had been until that point. Um, all of it was sold out. All of the uh, there were there were additional bleachers and benches built 
that morning to try and accommodate more and more people to see it. People were like um, uh, climbing up on their rooftops nearby just to see it and pay, like, paying their neighbours to go and sit on their roof. And mm -hmm. there were kids who were, you know, climbing up trees in order to see it. And so you're um, essentially that, that, that match broke Suzanne uh, in a lot of ways. It was an emotionally and physically taxing match that her father didn't want her to play. She fell out with her father over it. Uh, she didn't sleep uh, beforehand, things like this. And um, afterwards, uh, she she got to see all the uh, all the tickets and the money that that, that venue in Kansas was making off of mm, it. And okay. that's where it all sort of comes together for her, like. Uh, the whole thing sort of broke broke her spirit in terms of seeing how much money the larger institutions of the sport were making off of her mm. while she was destitute. Okay. Uh, I guess I didn't money. get whose ledger and money that those were. That was where I Right. Where yeah. I lost oh, it. that's a okay. shame. I, you know, it would be nice if it came across. <laughs> mm. Oh well. Um, yeah, there we go. I can't change it now. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's another scene where uh, she gets angry about the judge's call and the linesman is hard of hearing so she writes him a note do we have any mm. idea what the note actually said <laughs> <laughs> uh, no I, um, I'm not entirely sure but that happened that whole uh, scene happened mm. uh, but yeah I have no idea what she wrote I, <laughs> I, I, can, I can make some guesses well I understand she actually cursed quite a bit Oh, uh, then mm. we don't really get that from the book. Or were you kind of aiming at it? At, at we're trying to make it more fa like family friendly, or <laughs> who are you? Oh, no, that wasn't actually the intention. I um I wanted to point out when she did that that she did throw tantrums on court and get into arguments with umpires mm. and nine judges. Um, and that was where that that scene comes in because it was also getting a lot worse at that stage in her life. And so mm. it felt like the right time to talk about it. But previous to that, I think uh, I was more focused on the way in which uh, her parents would shout from the stands and berate her and, and how that was putting a strain on her, her match play in that sense and where that was all coming from and all the different pressures that were coming at her from just keeping a match winning streak going, which is going to sort of get to you mentally after a while um, mm -hmm. uh, to, yeah, all sorts of pressures that were coming at her, like from, from the journalists to the tennis institutions, from the public and the way that they saw her. Um, and so I wanted there to be outbursts, but I wasn't as... Um, I wasn't as in, as interested in having those outbursts in the early half, first half of the book. Do you know? Are there any recordings of her speaking? Uh, there's a couple of like old, uh, like Pafe um, videos uh, that you can like find on the BFI player. I think they're also on YouTube. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so, what lasting effect has Suzanne had on tennis today, a hundred years later? Uh, so I guess you could argue that like, her joining the professional tour started paving the way for the the, like, the sport to become professional. And mm -hmm. I mean, that that happens in the 60s. Uh, go, the open era begins. Right. Yeah. So I look, looked years. it up for our review. Yeah. It was like 68 right. or 69. Yeah. So yeah. a long time later. But it takes a while to yeah. get these things rolling. It does. And like, uh, you know, she was... She was like the first big name star to do it. And I think that did get the ball rolling. Um, mm -hmm. I think uh, obviously the ways in which she played changed the women's game before she came in onto the scene. Uh, the women's game was largely um, played from the baseline. Uh, some women even served under arm. There was a, a, a sort of move towards... Um, you know, the overarm serve, um, a slightly more uh, 
aggressive game coming forward more to the net and there was so like the, the game itself changed in terms of the way it was played i think the connection between fashion and tennis started here and and that sort of became like a bigger and more important aspect to the game as, as it went um and that relationship between the two having courtiers and uh you know even people like Fred Perry and Lacoste going on to create their own sort of fashion lines, um, I think wouldn't have had wouldn't have had much su- as much success, and tennis wouldn't have been that sort of chic, fashiony, you know, fashionable sport if it wasn't for Suzanne. Mm. Uh, I think she changed. She made it easier to. Uh, for women to play without the corsets. Um, mm. There were other players who were wearing uh, on-court attire without whalebone corsets, but it was Suzanne who made that like incredibly popular. Um, it's arguable that uh, Wimbledon changed venue and moved to where it is today because of Suzanne and to accommodate mm. the crowd who wanted to go and see her. Mm-hmm. I think there's a lot of different ways in which the sport changed. Um, yeah. Hmm. Okay. So what's next? Any dream projects? Yeah. Um, I think next I want to do something completely fictional. Another big love of mine is horror. And so I have a couple of ideas for horror comics in my head that I'd like to develop. Hmm. Interesting. At the moment, I'm in the early sort of, stages of doing a lot of reading around them and figuring out like exactly where to sort of hone in on and, and what to focus on. But, uh, that's been quite exciting. I'm doing another poem comic with Chrissy at the moment as well. Oh. Uh, so yeah, just sort of, uh, taking a bit of time to figure out, uh, exactly what the next project is, but like, mm-hmm. it's nice to have a couple of ideas sort of percolating. Mm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, enjoyed talking with you and I enjoyed the book. So thanks a lot. Oh, thanks. Take care. Suzanne by Tom Humberstone will be out from Avery Hill Press in early September. See more of Tom's work at TomHumberstone.com. And by the way, he told me he does actually usually say Humberstone. You can help the Deconstructing Comics family of podcasts by joining us on Patreon at Patreon.com slash DeconComics. And go to DeconstructingComics.com to connect to us on Twitter, Facebook, or YouTube to shop on Amazon to support the show and to find links to subscribe to the podcast. Our theme is by J.B. Anderton. If you're looking for some constructive feedback on your comic, send it to us and we'll critique it on our spinoff podcast, Critiquing Comics. Send it to mail at deconstructingcomics.com. We'll read it and record our critique. Next week, Emmett is joined by Elizabeth Sandifer, who publishes and blogs about the psychic history of comics and science fiction to discuss the new Sandman TV series. Till then, this is Tim, and thanks for listening to Deconstructing Comics. <laughs>